it seemed at the time impossible. Has the most famous ship in the history of the world been discovered at last? The Gilgamesh epic paralleled exactly the story of Noah in the Bible. There is plenty of ancient historical evidence spanning nearly 2,000 years that the Ark is on Mount Ararat. The location of the mystical Mount Sinai itself is the subject of relentless argument. The biblical story of the burning bush is completely true and totally provable. It must have seemed to Moses that God was asking him to do the impossible. In the book of Matthew, we're told that the graves were opened and the bodies of many dead saints were raised to life. During the night, all of Sennacherib's army had been struck down by some kind of plague. Mary Magdalene was a woman of independent means and spirit. For nearly 2,000 years, she's inspired millions of people, especially women. The Grail is believed by many to be the cup containing the wine that Christ associated with his blood at the Last Supper. According to the legend, only Sir Galahad was able to reach it, dying in a moment of transcendental glory. The sound of pottery shattering caught his attention. The curiosity of the world was ignited. The Dead Sea Scrolls date back almost 2,000 years. Along with the many papyrus and leather scrolls was a scroll made of copper. As Herod's men attempted to open the tomb, a blast of flame filled the chamber and drove them back. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered in, together into one place. And, let and the, the stars of heaven fear. fell unto earth. Fires are burning Thousands all over the city. And several plane crashes with countless calls to life. Yeah. Complete chaos is the only way I can describe the situation. For here. the great day of his wrath is come. It turns out that Bible prophecy has an unparalleled record of accuracy. The focus of the conflict lies in the destiny of Jerusalem. This will be the last great battle and the one in which God himself will eventually take part. you'll be amazed at what has been discovered. For thousands of years, historians have recorded the words of the prophets, men and women who claim to be able to see into the future. For most of us, the notion that some people can see beyond the horizon of time is simply unbelievable. But what if the ancients really could see the future? According to the ancient prophets, there is a terrible time approaching the nations of the earth. Could it be these prophets were witnesses to our generation? War, bloodshed, desolation, cataclysmic earthquakes, pestilence, misery, and famine have been foretold. But will all these prophecies be fulfilled? Are we, in fact, on the brink of the destruction of life as we know it on planet Earth? The words come to us across centuries and across cultural boundaries, full of symbolism. But what is it that gives these calamitous predictions their power? Why is it that millions of people the world over look for predictions of disaster and warnings of a few men who have been dead for thousands of years? The ancient prophets, as they are called, were frequently ignored, even by the people of their own generation. Is there any valid reason why we should be listening to them today? Is it even possible that they were speaking of our time? The ancient prophets, who were they? And what did they have to say that should interest us today? Were they writing to influence events of their own time? Or were they trying to warn our generation? Over 2,000 years ago, the biblical prophets Daniel and John the Revelator described strange beasts they said represented future kings and governments that would hold the fate of the entire world in their hands during the last days. 
As we look around us today, it appears that everything is falling into place pretty much the way these ancient prophets described it. But were these ancient prophets really qualified to speak to our generation? Is there some compelling reason we should be listening to them? For that matter, are we even sure what prophecy is? Setting aside all the biblical trappings for the moment, what does a modern dictionary tell us? Actually, the dictionary isn't much help. It simply states that prophecies are predictions, which really isn't anything like what the Bible is talking about in terms of prophecy. The fact is anyone can make predictions. Economists make predictions based on certain market patterns. Astrologers try to make predictions based on the positions of various planets. Your local TV weatherman makes predictions based on perceived weather patterns. And we see the somewhat mixed results of these predictions on our TV screens the next day. Hundreds of predictions are made every day. However, genuine prophets and genuine prophecy is extremely rare. Frequently, what a prophet has to say is at odds with the prevailing wisdom of his day. However, if he is a genuine prophet, what he says is correct. If we want to look at a biblical prophet like Isaiah and test their accuracy, we simply have to examine the historical record and verify that the prediction was fulfilled precisely. According to the Bible, in 701 BC, the powerful king of Assyria, Sennacherib, had conquered most of the Middle East and now had Jerusalem under siege. Hezekiah, king of Judea, was on the verge of surrender when he called for the prophet Isaiah. Sennacherib had sent messengers to Hezekiah, warning him not to depend upon his God to defend his city and his people, and reminding him that the king of Assyria had already destroyed all the land surrounding Jerusalem. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers, then according to 2 Kings, he went up to the house of the Lord and prayed. Knowing of the destruction already caused by the army of Sennacherib, we can only imagine how Hezekiah must have feared for his people and himself. Isaiah, however, was undismayed. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Hezekiah's thoughts at that moment are not recorded, but in spite of Isaiah's past record of 100% accuracy, it's safe to assume that this time he had his doubts, until the following morning. One of Hezekiah's commanders brought astonishing news. During the night, all of Sennacherib's army had been struck down by some kind of plague. Enemy corpses littered the hillsides. According to the Bible, 185,000 seasoned warriors had been in the camp of the Assyrians just the night before. When the sun came up, they were all dead. The words that Isaiah spoke in the name of the Lord had been fulfilled to the very letter. But is that kind of accuracy the exception or the rule? The best definition of prophecy is history written in advance. If the Word of God describes a future event, it is as certain to occur as if it has already happened. In ancient times, people seemed to rely more on their prophets than we do today. But there was a problem. After all, anyone could claim to be a prophet. How could they tell a true prophet from a pretender? Ancient Israelites had a unique way of distinguishing those prophets whom they could rely on from the false prophets that roamed the countryside. The true prophet had to be 100% correct his prophecy must be absolutely without error, down to the minutest detail. Anything less was met with instant and harsh punishment. The false prophet was simply stoned to death. In point of fact, there are no recorded instances of a false prophet ever being allowed to lead the people astray. There is at least one incident, however, that gives us some insight into how a prophet might have felt facing a hostile public. The Lord called upon Jonah and told him to go to Nineveh and warn the people of that great city's imminent destruction. But Jonah didn't want to go. Those were not nice people in that city, and Jonah feared for his life. The result was Jonah wound up in the belly of a great fish, and when the Lord saw fit to let him out, 
Jonah was in a much more obedient frame of mind. Which brings up another point. There were a number of ancient prophets who supposedly prophesied of things that would take place in the last days. They spoke at different times and in various places. How and why were these particular men selected? Who chooses the time, the place, and the subject matter? In the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's a matter of choice, God's choice. For example, Moses wasn't lobbying for the job when God spoke to him out of the burning bush, nor are any of the prophets known to have asked for the responsibility. Justin Martyr probably described the mechanics of prophecy best. Neither by nature nor by any human skill is it possible for men to know such high and holy things, but only by a gift that descends from above on holy men from time to time. They do not need training in speech or skill in controversy and argument, but only to keep themselves pure to receive the power of the Spirit of God. Justin Martyr also pointed out that the fact that all the Bible prophets agree, though separated in different cultures and at different times, is evidence that they were inspired by God. All of that notwithstanding, there are still several puzzling aspects of prophecy that leave many, if not most people, looking for answers. For example, does the prophet know in advance what he will be asked to predict? And does he have any idea when his prophecy might be fulfilled? So far as the when is concerned, God is not bound by our understanding of time. So for example, when Isaiah speaks about the coming of the Savior, even 600 years before the event, he uses both present tense, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a child is given, and future tense, and the government will be on his shoulders. As to what that depends entirely on the Lord. Moses was told where to go and what to say. Ezekiel was often simply told, say this. On the other hand, Daniel asked specific questions and got specific answers, even though he didn't always understand what he was hearing. Of course, God is the author of all true prophecy. Man is just the channel by which he communicates. I take that to mean that God can communicate his desires any way he sees fit. Daniel and Joseph were interpreters of dreams, their own and those of others. In one of the most astonishing stories in all of Scripture, Abraham actually negotiates with the Lord in an effort to save the righteous in Sodom. And Moses received his instructions directly from God in very explicit terms. The process is of little importance as long as the prophet is obedient to God's word and willing to carry it out. The past, present, and future are all merely divisions of what we call time. But what exactly is time? On Earth, we measure it by one 360-degree rotation of the planet, which cannot, of course, be applied to the universe. And according to Einstein, time is not a straight line, but a curve. Could this be a clue to the mystery of the phenomena we call prophecy? Is it possible that there is a scientific explanation? The word prophecy comes from combining two Greek roots, to speak and before. Simply put, telling the future. The past is a collective memory of humanity, what we believe once happened. The future is a collective faith in humanity, a belief that life and time will continue from the present forward. We don't understand the nature of prophecy, but that doesn't mean it isn't real. We also lack any real understanding of the properties of electricity, but we have learned to harness and use the phenomena very effectively. What we have learned, for example, is that what we call electricity travels around the wire conductor and not through it. A very simplified explanation of Einstein's unified field theory is that all the energy and the forces in the universe are the same fundamental field or force. In the space-time theorem of general relativity is a proof that the causer of the universe brings it into existence independent of the time dimension of our universe. Now, since time is defined as that dimension or realm in which cause and effect phenomena takes place, 
This implies that the cause er can operate in the equivalent of at least two dimensions of time. As such, he can not only help the prophets foresee the future, he can actually predetermine it. 800 years after Moses, the biblical prophets claimed direct contact with Jehovah. Joel, Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and others all foretold the future of Israel and the nations of the world. Untold millions of people over the centuries have believed and still do believe that God spoke directly to all the prophets. The events spoken of by these men, however, reach far beyond their own time. Indeed, many of the prophecies touch our own time and beyond. But have we finally reached the end of the line? Does the reach of the ancient prophets extend only as far as our generation? Are there ancient prophecies that only we can recognize as having been fulfilled? Did the ancients indeed look into their future and see our present? And even if they did, what could they have possibly known that we don't? The purpose of prophecy, it would seem, is to teach and to warn or prepare people for coming events. But in order for that to be of any value, the people for whom the prophecy is intended must have some understanding of what that prophecy means and be willing to prepare themselves accordingly. Today we live on the cusp of a new millennium. We are bathed in technology that even the most imaginative science fiction writers could not have anticipated a scant 50 years ago. So why should we, as a people, even bother with prophecies that go back thousands of years? Haven't we put in place the mechanisms to avoid the plagues and disasters the prophets speak of? Or has our technology actually created the devices necessary to give those prophecies a sense of probability? Perhaps we should take a closer look at some of the warnings to see if they meet the test of truth, to see if, in fact, any of the ancient forecasts are coming true. The Bible is unique among all the books in the world because, in addition to other things, it forecasts specific events accurately in detail, even centuries before they occur. Approximately 2,000 prophecies appear in the pages of the Bible, most of which have already been fulfilled to the letter. Many remaining prophecies may be unfolding before our very eyes. So let's put these prophecies to the biblical test. And since we don't have time to test all of the biblical prophecies, let's look at some that are particularly detailed. Sometime before 500 BC, the prophet Daniel proclaimed that Israel's long-awaited Messiah would begin his public ministry 483 years after the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. He further prophesied that the Messiah would be cut off or killed, and that all this would take place prior to the second destruction of the temple. There is an enormous amount of documentation regarding the birth and death of Jesus Christ, but relative to this particular prophecy, a decree regarding the restoration of Jerusalem was issued by the Persian king Artaxerxes to the Hebrew priest Ezra in 458 BC. Precisely 483 years later, Jesus Christ rode into the city of Jerusalem. It was Christ's official presentation of Himself as the Messiah, which was prophesied by Zechariah. In the 5th century BC, way before Jesus' time, the prophet Zechariah declared the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And further, that this money would be used to buy a burial ground for Jerusalem's poor foreigners. Bible writers and secular historians alike record 30 pieces of silver as the sum paid to Judas Iscariot for betraying Jesus. The money cast aside by Judas in his anguish was used to purchase a potter's field just as prophesied. There are over 330 prophecies about Jesus Christ all coming true in one person, Jesus of Nazareth. Now anyone can make predictions, but having them fulfilled is another story. The science of probability has some interesting things to say about the Old Testament prophecies regarding a Messiah. Professor Emeritus of Science, Peter Stoner of Westmont College, with the help of 600 college students, calculated the probability of one man fulfilling just eight of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. 
The students carefully weighed all the factors and examined the various circumstances which might indicate that men had somehow conspired together to fix these individual prophecies. They made their estimates as conservative as possible. Then Professor Stoner invited other scientists to submit their own independent estimates to gauge if the calculations of his students were accurate. Yet it was what the statistical conclusions indicated that was astounding. By the most conservative estimate, some 456 messianic prophecies were fulfilled in one man, Jesus of Nazareth. But Professor Stoner and his students examined only eight of those prophecies. According to the science of probability, the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. How big a number is 10 to the 17th power? If you covered the entire state of Texas, to a depth of two feet with silver dollars, and then dropped in a single marked dollar and mixed them all up. Your chance of finding that marked dollar on your first try wearing a blindfold would be one in 10 to the 17th power. Statistical science then suggests a high degree of probability that Jesus was the Messiah predicted by the prophets of the Old Testament. So let's take a look at some of those prophecies. Know all men of Nazareth, that by command of Caesar Augustus there will be conducted a census of the subject territories of Galilee and Judea. All men must register in the towns and cities of their birth. According to Micah chapter 5 verse 2, Bethlehem was chosen for a pivotal event. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. When Luke the physician sat down to write a letter to Theophilus so that he might know the exact order of events in the life of the one called Jesus Christ. It tells about the birth of Jesus. Mary and Joseph were required to go to Bethlehem because there was a taxation going on ordered by Caesar Augustus. Luke tells us that this enrollment came at the time of Caesar Augustus. And Quirinius was governor of Syria at that time. And when this enrollment, this taxation process was required, it was the first. There were others that were going to follow. For years, there were no references to Quirinius, the governor of Syria. And then they found one reference and said, well, wait a minute, that's not at the same time that Luke was saying that the census took place. But now they have found other historical references that seems to indicate either he had a very long reign or he was governor twice of Syria. And all of a sudden, the historical record, apart from Luke's writing, says this is totally feasible and it is plausible. The truth is that modern archaeology has illuminated this issue in such a way that we can have great confidence that Luke was essentially accurate in what he was reporting. In fact, we have an ancient document that's dated 104 AD that confirms that people who were living away from their provinces needed to return home to their provinces for the census. We also have another document dated 48 AD that confirms that entire families were involved in this census. And so we have documents which talk about the same kind of census that Luke records in the New Testament. The Jews of the time had grown up with prophetic assurances that a Messiah would come. But what were they expecting? Isaiah said, He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. What images did those words invoke in a people suffering under Roman rule? At the very least, that suggests a savior, a great warrior, a god who could take the Roman world by the throat and uh, beat it into submission. The Jews during the time of Jesus held to the almost universal belief that when the Messiah came, he would be the son of David, he would rule upon the throne of David, and it wasn't difficult for these oppressed people to believe that the greatness of Israel would be restored, just as it was many centuries earlier when the youngest son of Jesse ruled upon the throne. You know, the idea of uh, any other kind of salvation simply did not occur to them. 
it's not too surprising then that most of the Jews of that time had difficulty accepting the idea that such a mighty savior could come from such humble beginnings. But what about today? Do we have a better understanding of the role of Jesus as the Messiah? When I was an atheist, I would have looked you in the eye and I would have told you that Jesus Christ, if he ever walked the planet, was probably a very nice man and a very good teacher, but he never thought he was God and he certainly wasn't God. But I spent two years of my life systematically investigating the historical evidence for Christianity. And I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ not only claimed to be God, but he proved it by being resurrected from the dead. Surprisingly, there is little word of the whereabouts of Jesus as a boy or of his growth to manhood until his sudden appearance in Galilee at age 30. So far as the Gospels are concerned, not much is known about those intervening years. Our introduction to Jesus the man comes through John the Baptist. In fact, there are those who date the ministry of Jesus from his baptism by John in the River Jordan. Other scholars suggest Jesus didn't really begin his ministry until John was arrested. You cannot read the historical accounts of John the Baptist unbiased and conclude that Jesus was a follower of John the Baptist. See, everybody thought maybe he was because he was so unusual. And they said, are you the one we're looking? He said, no, I am not the one. A greater one than I am coming. I am the forerunner. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. John the Baptist constantly pointed to the Messiah who would come, and in his words, a direct reference to Jesus Christ. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all mankind shall see the salvation of God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Jesus we meet at the River Jordan soon begins to demonstrate that he is a Jesus of miracles. But can we be sure that this Jesus was the miracle worker of the Gospels? Did he walk on water, feed thousands with just a few loaves and fishes, cause the blind to see, the lame to walk? Did he bring Lazarus forth from the tomb where he had lain for four days, raise a small child from the dead, and finally rise from the dead himself? In short, are the miracles as real as the man? According to Luke, John the Baptist not only recognized Jesus, who was his cousin, but also recognized what his role would be while in the world. His was to be a ministry of miracles. It would not be long before Jesus began to demonstrate his unique and remarkable power. I have been told you have a momentary lapse in your supply of wine. You do have more, of course. I have no idea how much we'd need. We, oh, we've served a great deal already. But there is wine. What is this? This is the best wine I have ever tasted. Most families serve the best wine first. Excellent! The changing of water to wine at the wedding in Cana seems almost trivial in context. But it marks the beginning of a series of remarkable events, each one carefully noted by one or more of the Gospel writers. It is this series of events that sets the stage for everything that Jesus would ultimately claim to be. Scholars have approached Christ trying to find the right solvent to be able to distinguish between the historical Jesus and what is called the Christ of faith. No one has been able to find that solvent because the portrait of Jesus Christ in the New Testament is stubborn. It is immune to separation from the historical and the so-called miraculous Christ. 
The simple reason is because they are one and the same. Jesus gathered together 12 disciples, men of little note, fishermen, a tax collector, men of the country, all except one Judas Iscariot, a man of the city. The Gospels would be a product of this group of men. That is important to remember since we must rely solely on the integrity of these disciples if we are to accept as truth the fantastic stories of the miracles of Jesus. How do we reconcile what the authors of the Gospels themselves tell us? Were they witnesses, or did they get their information secondhand? Who were they writing for, and what were their credentials for undertaking the work? Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed also good to me to write an orderly account for you. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, which you yourselves know. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. According to the testimony of the men who wrote the record, they were either eyewitnesses or transcribing the words of those who were participants in the events in the life of Jesus. But more importantly, they recognized that those to whom they were writing were also participants and witnesses. Still, what do we know of these men? Are their testimonies reliable? According to long-standing Christian tradition, Luke was a well-educated Greek physician and a companion of Paul who tells us he undertook an intensive study of all the events surrounding the life of Jesus before writing about them. Mark, the companion of Peter, also indicates a great reverence for detail in his record, devoting his efforts totally to recording Peter's eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. Matthew appears on every list of the disciples of Jesus. While most Christian scholars place Mark's gospel as the main source of the synoptics, the Catholic Church gives primacy to Matthew's first-person account. And John's gospel, while different in content and construction, is likewise the product of one who was there with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry, and, in fact, lived longer than any of them. According to Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon in 180 AD, so firm is the ground upon which these gospels rest that the very heretics themselves will bear witness to them. Which brings us to our next area of investigation, non-biblical sources, not all of which were kind or even respectful. They do, however, attest to the fact that Jesus was a very real historical figure. Jesus Christ is the most fascinating, interesting person in human history. There's no one that's been like him, there never will be. Jesus Christ is the only person in human history who has ever claimed that he would raise himself from the dead and actually done it, and there's historical evidence to prove it. Jesus Christ has transformed the world like nobody before him or after him. For example, he dignified the value of human labor in the ancient world. This ultimately led to the abolishment of slavery in the ancient world. Take another example, charity. Christ unleashed the forces of charity. Because of him and in his name, orphanages and hospitals have been founded all over the world. Take another example, education and literacy. Do you realize that hundreds of languages were first set to writing by Christian missionaries to get the Bible or the word of Christ into that as of yet unwritten tongue? There's nobody in the world that's had the influence on planet Earth as Jesus Christ has had. There are eight to ten major non-biblical secular references to the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was a historical figure. You have uh, leaders in the second generation like Papias, uh, which I believe was Bishop of Smyrna, and then you have Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch. And in their teachings, they say what they are teaching came directly from the mouths of the apostles. In other words, especially John, the Apostle John, discipled Papias and 
Ignatius. And so they're saying, this is what we learn from those who lived and walked with Jesus. So even into the second century, you have a direct tie back to the apostles and the first century church. And Ignatius points out in his writings that the four gospels were so accepted already, 180 uh, AD, were so accepted, he referred to them as the four points of the compass, that they were so accurate. Not all of the non-biblical sources were believers, however. Flavius Josephus, the highly regarded Jewish historian, provides corroboration not only for the life of Jesus, but for John the Baptist as well. Other well-known historians also left behind brief sketches of Jesus. Cornelius Tacitus was a Roman historian who confirms that Jesus was crucified as a criminal under Pontius Pilate. He also tells us that Christianity had its origins in ancient Judea. Christians grew to a vast multitude in Rome itself, in spite of the fact that their founder was executed as a criminal. Suetonius was an official historian of Rome during the reign of Emperor Trajan. Among other things, his writings confirm Luke's statement in Acts 18.2 regarding the expulsion of Jews from Rome by the Emperor Claudius. He also makes it clear that there were a significant number of Christians living in Rome before the mid-60s AD. The writings of Roman governor Pliny the Younger are particularly interesting in view of the teachings presented in the New Testament. According to Pliny, the Christians were a people who loved the truth at any cost. He wrote that they met on a certain day before it was light, singing a hymn to Christ as to a God, and were bound by an oath not to sin. Pliny the Younger was not sure what to think about all this. In fact, a remarkable note on Pliny's part is that early believers, true believers, could not be made to worship either the emperor or false gods. Modern science also takes a hand in confirming the Gospels from secular sources that are often unsympathetic to Christianity. For example, one of the most miraculous aspects of the crucifixion was the darkness that covered the land from the sixth to the ninth hour. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, record the event. But so did several secular historians, among them a man named Thallus, who lived and wrote in 52 AD, or approximately the same time that the Gospels were being written. Thallus tells us that the darkness totally covered the land at the time of the Passover in AD 32. And unable to find a reason for such a thing, he attributes it to a total solar eclipse. But 200 years later, Julius Africanus pointed out that the theory of Thallus was undoubtedly wrong since a solar eclipse cannot occur during a full moon, which is always the case during Passover. Modern astronomers concur with Africanus. The Jewish Passover of 32 AD was undoubtedly during the full moon since the entire Jewish liturgical calendar depended on determining the precise lunar position. Critics might argue that Matthew, Mark, and Luke fabricated the whole darkness episode to suit their own purposes. But if so, why would Thallus, a Syrian and a secular historian who was alive at the time, confirm it? And it should be pointed out that these historical witnesses come from original sources. The best evidence that Jesus was a real historical character does not come so much from his followers and disciples, but from those who rejected him. His own Jewish people, the rabbis, in the second to fifth centuries wrote about Jesus, wrote about his death, wrote about his miracles, wrote about his disciples, wrote about their death, wrote about their miracles. That's evidence that's reliable. Why did you doubt? The New Testament is both a theological and historical record, but the important thing here is that at points where we can check out the text, the New Testament can be confirmed and therefore we conclude it's accurate. It is of course difficult to scientifically or historically prove that any of the miracles of Jesus actually happened other than to argue that if blatantly false stories about Jesus were told, 
they certainly would have been challenged by his followers and eyewitness observers. No such challenges to the veracity of the Gospels appear anywhere in the record. He's a leper. He's unclean. Move back. Be clean. The miracles performed by Jesus were apparently not limited only to Jews. Anyone who exhibited faith could expect to benefit from his remarkable healing power. Lord, I know that you have the power to heal. My servant lies at home paralyzed, in terrible pain. Well, take me to them. No, my Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. But just, just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, my lord, with soldiers under me. If I tell this one go, he goes. If I tell that one come, he comes. If I say to my servant, do this, he does it. I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in all of Israel with faith as great as this man. Go. It will be done just as you believed it would. Master! Look at me! It's a miracle! It's a miracle! I knew it would be so! Oh, God, be praised! According to scholars, most of the miracles of Jesus were accomplished in and around the small coastal town of Capernaum. Understandably, word soon spread of his marvelous healing power, particularly among the poor and disenfranchised. Everyone, it seems, knew who Jesus was and what he could do. Who touched me? But Lord, look at all these people. How come you ask who touched me? I felt power go out from me. Lord, forgive me. For 12 years I've been suffering with this issue of blood. I spent all my money on doctors, but they only made me worse. I thought if I could touch the hem of your garment, I'd be healed. Daughter. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You are freed from your suffering. Once again, Jesus calls the witnesses of the miracle to have faith while demonstrating that there are great rewards for believing in him. But the most spectacular miracles were still to come. Take away the stone. Jesus made utterly fantastic claims about himself and he backed it up with his words and his deeds and he proved it by his death and resurrection from the dead. At least 10 biblical prophecies were fulfilled in 1948 when the Jewish people finally received their ancestral home in Israel. 
2,700 years ago, the prophet Amos declared that the Jews would again have Israel as their own land and that they would never be uprooted again. Then 2,600 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel received a vision from God in which Israel as a people was viewed as a scattering of dead bones. In this vision, God told Ezekiel that the dry bones represented Israel and that they would be brought back to life. When the Jews were brought back to the land and country of Israel, it was the first time in 2,800 years that Israel was both united and independent, just as Ezekiel had prophesied. Ezekiel also said that Israel would come back as a united people. He wrote, I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. Jeremiah prophesied that the final Israel would be more impressive than the first, and in a separate passage, God promised to watch over them when they returned. In the book of Leviticus, the Lord tells Israel that if they are obedient, He said, You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred, a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. In every subsequent clash with its Arab enemies, the army of Israel has fulfilled that prophecy. And finally, almost 3,400 years before these events, God in the book of Deuteronomy promises to gather Israel from even the most distant lands under heaven and bring His people back to the land that belonged to your fathers. And He said, you will take possession of it. Many of us have watched as the fulfillment of these prophecies have unfolded before our eyes, and this is just a tiny sample of the hundreds of prophecies that scholars point to as having been fulfilled. The evidence seems compelling and persuasive, and if those prophecies have been literally fulfilled, what about those that are yet to be satisfied? The calamitous wars, destructive natural disasters, and horrible devastations. Is there any real evidence that we are living in the last days? And if we are, is there anything we can do to change or alter the dreadful winding up scenes that have been foretold? So far, the outcomes of the prophecies we have examined appear to be unequivocal. The biblical prophets have been right on. What does that tell us then about what we have to look forward to? For hundreds of years, this new millennium has been anticipated with fear and trepidation by people of all nations and cultures. Is this fear justified? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus himself makes it very clear that regarding his return, no one would know the exact time of his coming. However, I believe that Jesus wanted his followers to discern the signs of the times. Otherwise, why would there be such explicit warnings in the Bible? But. Are we paying attention? Are we willing to discern the signs of the times? Could it be that these signs are unfolding all around us while we blissfully ignore them? According to Daniel chapter 9, and verse 27, end time events will begin with a peace treaty. This treaty will reinstitute sacrificial worship on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And with a stroke of a pen, the world will enter a time of tribulation such as it has never known before. If we're looking for answers in the words of the prophets, we had better start looking more closely at what's going on around us. Some Bible prophecies are conditional. For example, after Jonah had learned his lesson in the belly of the great fish, he then relented and went to Nineveh. And God gave him a message to deliver, saying, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Even though there was no clear condition to the prophecy, we know that the people of Nineveh repented, and the city was spared. The implied condition for saving the city was repentance. How much difference is there between repentance and a change of heart? Does the hope of the world rest upon these ancient concepts? According to scholars, there are some 500 biblical prophecies still to be fulfilled. And many of these same scholars say they point to our day. The ancient city of Babylon was the most powerful city the ancient world had ever known. However, the world has never yet seen the fulfillment of the prophecy of Babylon as a great power in the last days. 
President Saddam Hussein of Iraq seems determined to set himself up as a successor to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He is determined that Babylon once again become a world power. Isaiah tells us that Babylon will become the jewel of the kingdom, the glory of the Babylonians' pride. For nearly three decades, Hussein has been trying to restore Babylon to become just such a power. He has also declared himself to be the great successor of King Nebuchadnezzar, whose ancient kingdom included all of today's Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Kuwait, and he seems bent on reclaiming the entire kingdom. As recently as 20 years ago, all that existed on the ancient site of Babylon were dusty ruins. However, today, visitors can see the throne room of the southern palace of Nebuchadnezzar, including Proclamation Street, a Greek theater, many temples, and a half-scale model of the Ishtar Gate, and the building continues. Some have suggested that this prophecy has already been fulfilled. However, the prophecy is clear. Babylon is becoming a world power. Babylon is being rebuilt by Saddam Hussein. And Babylon has never been destroyed by fire from heaven as Sodom and Gomorrah, as Isaiah predicted. Therefore, I believe Babylon will be rebuilt, and its rebuilding is a sign of the last days. Another of the great biblical prophets that seem to be focused on our day is the prophet Daniel. In fact, several of his prophecies seem to involve events, even technologies, that have only appeared in the modern generation. The book of Daniel, the prophet sees a vision. Ten kings that would have no kingdom, represented by ten horns. Then a little horn emerges and appears to take over. Today, representatives of 13 nations gather in this building to plan and prepare for a united Europe. Each of the representatives has a sovereign interest, but none of them are kings or leaders of their respective nation. Interestingly, this pact was inaugurated in 1959 in Rome with seven members, and according to the charter, the number of the nations was not to exceed 10. The number of participants has changed periodically, but if this is indeed to be the 10 kingdoms spoken of by Daniel, we are still waiting for the little horn, which will replace three others. This is the great leader who will emerge, effect a peace treaty with Israel, reinstitute blood sacrifice on the Temple Mount, and eventually govern as the very personification of evil. And while the Bible gives us many clues to the character of this leader, it does not tell us exactly when he will appear. Are we the generation that will face the terrible tribulations spoken of by Daniel? Will we see a flaming mountain fall into the sea and watch as wormwood poisons the water? In a stunning example, perhaps of reading prophecy in today's headlines, the year 2000 brought us face to face with a new threat. An additive to gasoline required by the EPA to reduce toxic emissions was found to be seeping into the nation's groundwater. It could, we were told, endanger a third of the nation's water supply. And even the notion that something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea is showing up in today's headlines and being discussed on TV. Actually, an asteroid missed the Earth just last year, one about 50 yards, 50 meters across. Now, we can work out the energy associated with that if it had hit. And you're talking about something like 20 megatons of TNT. That's a very large nuclear weapon equivalent. And clearly, it would have been sufficient to take out at least a large city, if not a larger area. If it had happened above an ocean, then it could have provoked a tsunami, which would have caused widespread devastation when that tidal wave hit the coasts. The prophets also tell us there will be an increase in earthquake activity in many places. Are the incidences of earthquakes actually increasing? We need to remember that the Bible says nothing about the magnitude of earthquakes. Nevertheless, according to the latest report on geologic hazards from the National Earthquake Information Center in Denver, Colorado, the number of earthquakes in the range of 6 to 6.9 on the Richter scale for the years 1987 to 1992 was 608. However, for the next six years, 1993 to 1998, the number at this intensity was 885. When you look at all earthquakes worldwide, for those very same years, regardless of intensity, the report shows an average increase of 5,300 per year. 
this would seem to me to be a fairly significant increase in earthquake activity. Nearly a quarter of the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New, deals with prophecy, most of it already fulfilled. But is the prophetic evidence we've seen sufficient to prove we are in the wind-up phase of a weary world? Or is there more? You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places. Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and the time is near. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. There is an old saying that reminds us, it wasn't raining when Noah started to build the ark. But is now the time to start preparing? Have the ancient prophets given us enough evidence to determine that we are in the last days? One thing seems certain, since God has told us he is unchanging. If the dreaded warnings of the ancient prophets are to be altered in any way, like the people of Nineveh, we will have to do the changing. <laughs>